Be Captain America, Steve. It's been a long road going from the campy initial decades of superhero adaptations to the global dominance of the MCU. Many people have forgotten just how goofy most of the initial attempts at translating superhero costumes to film actually were. Actually, just how goofy translating superheroes to film were, period. Just look at Red Brown's Captain America costume. It's a far cry from Simon and Kirby's original idea, let alone what we got in the MCU, even if some of the costumes do kinda always feel the same. It's a phenomenon that's talked about a lot on the internet lately, especially in short form social media environments, the homogenization of Marvel's costumes. Well, there's a reason for that. But before we dive too deep, why do superheroes wear spandex in the first place? Well, the quick answer for that is Jules Leotard. If you're familiar with Leotard, he was a circus performer from the 1800s. A brilliant one at that. Born in 1838 to a gymnastics instructor in Toulouse, France, he was initially planning on being a lawyer. He passed his exams and was all set to work in a legal firm when he just couldn't shake his passion for the circus. A true performer at heart, he had dreams of building an apparatus that would enable him to swing above crowds, soaring through the air, and he did just that. Jules Leotard not only invented the art of the trapeze, he also created what we refer to today as, well, the Leotard. Starting in the late 1930s, characters like Superman and the Phantom popularized fighting crime while clad in these tight, sometimes strange looking costumes. Most superhero costumes are a combination of Leotard's flying uniform and circus strongman outfits. They were theoretically meant to both display the muscles of the wearer and allow for ease of movement. A practical way to show off. However, these costumes quickly evolved into visual metaphors. What does Wonder Woman stand for? Female empowerment and the ideas of her adopted homeland reflected in her gauntlets and her star-spangled attire. Batman, creature of the night, otherworldly vampire, unless he's punching the Joker off a 50-foot tall piano. We just don't talk about those stories as much, it's fine, but you get the idea. The superhero's costume is a reflection of the ideas that they believe in, a theatrical display of rebelling against the status quo. So let's circle back around. When attempting to translate these costumes to the screen in the early days of comic book adaptations, most productions opted for a one-to-one -one approach, literally clothing their heroes in literal spandex just like their supposed four-color equivalent. This basically leads to 45 years of characters having costumes that feel off, not too realistic, and play the narrative of Biff Bang Pow comics, and that this is just for kids in one way or another. There's a larger than life nature to the illustrated page that just doesn't function the same way in real life. Drawing Batman in a spandex suit there, it's understood that in that reality he has armor underneath it, even though we can see his abs. Which is how you get those weird plastic Batman film abs. See how that works in one place but not another? But then we get to March of 2002. Everything changes. If you're unfamiliar, The Ultimates was a part of an imprint at Marvel where they restarted the books, making them contemporary and inviting in new readers. Didn't have an intimate knowledge of Spider-Man's backstory? No problem. Just pick up Ultimate Spider-Man number one, where the journey was jump-starting all over again. Now, it's hard to overstate the impact that Brian Hitch's character designs for The Ultimates had on both the comic book industry and the idea of superhero costumes across nearly every franchise. Hitch was the first artist to answer the question, what would superheroes look like in real life? His visual solutions for this reflected the tone of the books. Darker, more grounded, and more serious in nature. Gone was Iron Man's bulky refrigerator armor from the 60s, and here was a robot suit that looked like something straight out of popular science. An actual, functional robot suit. Same with Thor, goodbye massive yellow boots, winged helmets, and bright red capes. A rib leather jumpsuit and boots were here to stay. The aesthetic of the Ultimates was taking the beloved Marvel characters, boiling them down to their essentials, and then rebuilding them using athletic apparel, military equipment, tactical body armor, things that people would put on their bodies in place of spandex and capes. And it set the comic book world on fire. The Ultimates was notable for many reasons, the most primary of which was probably the fact that it perfected the widescreen approach to comics, which ironically is what the Avengers movies would be mimicking very quickly thereafter. Believe it or not, The Ultimates is the rough template for both the general approach of the MCU and specifically Joss Whedon's film, The Avengers. This gets right down to the visuals of the universe. The stylistic approach that Brian Hitch brought to designing superhero costumes on a page was grounded in leather over spandex, utilitarian looks, and a general feeling that they could be worn by a real person out in public, as opposed to this. It is hard to get modern America to take full-on spandex seriously on someone like Captain America. I get that. But also, not every character works under that overly logical visual aesthetic. I want to take a quick break here to give a thank you to the sponsor of this video, Noom. 
What I love about Noom is that it's different from the other health fads you might have seen. It's a new way to get healthy, lose weight, that uses psychology and habit change. It learns how your mind works, it learns the why behind the decisions you make, and at the end of the day, learning, not dieting, is what creates lasting change. This isn't necessarily all about weight, it's really just about being healthy. And Noom is all about support. You get your own personal goal specialist. These are real people trained in psychology, fitness, and nutrition. They help with things like meal plans. They make sure to work around your lifestyle. So if this all sounds cool to you, go to the link in the description for your online evaluation. It's quick, it's easy, helps me out, helps the channel out, and it will help you create your own custom plan. All right, back to the video. See, so a general approach to the idea of superhero costume design will be fully embraced by the man who would soon be put in charge of designing all of the costumes for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That'd be this guy on your screen right now. See, Ryan here is currently the head of visual development at Marvel Studios. Originally from Northeast Ohio, he got his start in video games before eventually transitioning into film. He's worked on the MCU films since Iron Man 1. It's his digital paintbrush, along with an army of fellow concept designers that have designed all of the costumes and suits for the MCU. Many of the hitch tropes that we've talked about and he established are repeated in the MCU's approach to superhero costume designs. Ribbed or structured ribcage elements and emphasis on paramilitary gear, straps, and structured costume elements are pervasive in nearly every on-screen Marvel character. Captain America, a literal agent of the US government, or Tony Stark, Iron Man, a robotic super soldier. Yet these design approaches make sense for them. However, the aesthetic of extra-governmental paramilitary chic doesn't quite fit everyone and is way too big of a mouthful to say over and over over again in meetings. Well, we won't spoil, I guess, any of the other elements of the story that you might not be able to figure out from the very blatant marketing from the film. But needless to say, Shang-Chi is a martial arts master, in the vein of Bruce Lee, so you'd think his MCU costume, which thankfully isn't his comic book costume of running around in pajama pants, shoeless with a headband, would be something along the lines of, well, Lee's iconic Game of Death jumpsuit, right? It's practically a superhero costume already, but well, you'd be wrong. They went with this. A structured, Gore-Tex looking, leathery, almost athleisure suit of armor? Sort of? It's interesting. The costume's common ancestry to Hitch is obviously apparent, but why is a martial arts master who needs to be able to move around freely wearing plastic leather armor? Same thing can be said for Scarlet Witch. In general, her costume in the comics just befuddled the MCU design department so much that they didn't have her in her suit from the first near decade of her being a fixture of popular culture. Her initial visual look was more mall goth hot topic employee than fearsome chaos magic wielder. And when they did get her costume at the end of WandaVision, it's, well, plastic leather structured pseudo armor. Well, again, the question is why? Honestly, Wanda's joke costume from the Halloween episode is a much stronger visual silhouette. It's obviously very flawed, but it's here. Imagine that crown on a costume that wasn't played for laughs. It could work. See, overall, the MCU has a myriad of accomplishments, which it would be futile attempting to list, at least here. However, one common criticism is that the films feel a bit uniform or cookie cutter. This goes back to two points. The use of humor, which erodes character individuality sometimes. Ugh, Mr. Rogers, I almost forgot that that suit did nothing for your ass. As far as I'm concerned, that's America's ass. And the visual sameness of the character designs and sometimes behaviors. Should a mystical character like Doctor Strange, Scarlet Witch, or Dumamu all share a common visual language? Sure. Is there an issue that the paramilitary grounded characters share a common design scheme? No. The issue is that everything in the MCU is filtered through the same precise and very narrow lens. Why are the same space activating, ribbing, and patterning on Spider-Man's costume on Captain America's costume? It's also on Shuri's costume. Costume. Every character's general visual look seems to be drawn on the same tapestry. And when you start adding in hero after hero, universe after universe, it becomes a little, well, tedious. The concept designers at Marvel, the costume designers at Marvel, are master craftsmen. Could they create inventive solutions for these issues? Absolutely, but it's not always up to them. Which is why we're not here to talk about what they've done wrong. There are producers and directors and executives to consider on the simple fact that not everyone working on these comic book characters actually likes their costumes, but I mean, come on. Am I the only one still hoping for a Batrock the Leaper movie appearance where he isn't wearing a purple jacket? Put the guy in the mask and the mustache already. Let's see what happens. Well, that's all for this episode of Nostalgic Guys. If you enjoyed this one, press that like button down below. This is a topic that really interests me, so I'm glad we got a chance to talk about it. As always, hit subscribe if you haven't yet done so. Two more episodes on your screen right now. You can check those out, and hopefully I will see you guys in the next video.